Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. Great to be with you and we do hope you're going to enjoy the interviews lined up this morning. Jakob van Skalkweik will be in to talk about raising boys to be good men. So obviously it's all about role modeling for boy children. But first up, he started life out as a security guard then moved on to become a butler at a five-star hotel in Santon. And in the process has authored four books, obviously self-published. He is still a butler, but he has big dreams and big plans and no doubt, inshallah, they will soon be realized. His name is On Karabile Wisdom Makoto. Let's hear his story. Morning, welcome to the program. Good morning and thank you so much for inviting me here. My pleasure entirely. Congratulations on authoring four books. Thank you. And this too, having started out as a security guard. And that's where and how your story starts. And we as fellow South Africans take our situations, we take each other for granted. We walk in malls, we walk in streets and sadly, security guards, gardeners, um, house helpers, etc. All of these people, even waiters for that matter, yes, yes. are almost invisible. They're the invisible community of um, society. They're there to serve us. And we don't ever give them a second thought. We don't realize there's a life behind that facade. There's a personality, there's dreams, there's wishes, there's aspirations, just like me, you, and everybody else. Yes. You're one of those remarkable people that started as a security guard, but look where you are, four books later and still working very hard. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. How does the story start for you? Not your books, your life story. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it started when, when I came to Johannesburg in 2003. From where? From Northwest. I'm okay. originally from Northwest. So when I came here, actually, my passion was to be a singer. You know, uh, I remember I met one of uh, a singer who was singing in 1980s by the name of Signe Mohopudi. So this man actually inspired me a lot. I used to listen to his music and I wanted to be like him because he actually is my home brother. We come from the same place. So when I came here, I met him to mentor me about music, only to find out that he's no longer actually singing those songs, but now he's now a religious person. Then he started sharing the word of God with me and that's where I became converted to, to Christianity. And he started there, you know, um, I, I became passionate now about, about speaking the word of God, sharing the word of God with other people. And your first book is about that, is yes, it not? Yes, my first book is about okay. that, yes. Then after finishing my trick, I went to Vets University to study Bachelor of Education, which is known as teaching. And unfortunately, I dropped out on, on my third year, you know, because of some situations. And, and after that, that's when now life was very tough. And, and I had now to see what to do you know, so that I can make a living. And jobs are difficult to come jobs by. Jobs are difficult to come by, especially if you're not qualified. I mean, even though you are qualified, they're still difficult, but how much more now if you're not qualified, you know? So it was worse now. Then I said, okay, you know, what can I do? You know, and I remember one of my friends came to me and he said, listen, man, uh, why can't you do training for security guard in the meantime, you know? And I said, no, that, that's a good idea. You know, that's where now I went to security okay, industry. Okay, so your studies were interrupted. Yes. You became a security guard, and in your spare time, or whilst you were working as a security guard, you decided to start writing because you believed you had stories to yes, tell. Yes, yes. Where did that come from? How did you realize that you can become an author, that you can put pen to paper? Um, it's about spreading the message, you know. As you are saying that if you have a story, you want people to know your story. If you have a message, you want people to hear your message. And, and I thought that obviously I cannot reach everyone through mouth speaking, you know, but I needed a way of reaching out today. And I said, the best way is to write a book, you know, that's when my first book came out. And I started writing my first book in 2013, but I only released it in 2017. 
you know. Because it's tough, you self-publish, exactly. you needed to put yes. money into publishing the book. Yes, you know, and also a lack of knowledge also. I did not know where to go, how to do it, you know. So it actually delayed my process. Uh, until 2017, actually 2016, when I went to a certain event where there was a pastor who was preaching and he made a testimony about his life, about writing. And after that, I said, no, you know, this is God speaking to me. And immediately after the event, I went and researched, how can I do, what can I do to be, uh, to be a writer? And that's where I got, I got connections of, of, of writing my, my first And the title book. of your first book? It's titled, How to Hear God When He Speaks. And that's all about the first part of your journey. Of my journey. Right. Um, your tertiary education, you've managed to write four books. Are you ever going to go back to varsity, whether it's through private studies or going to tertiary, to complete your degree and perhaps pursue it? Or is that now something in the past? Has your life changed course completely and you have other interests, <laughs> other passions? <laughs> yes, that's a good one. Um, I will go back definitely uh, to, to study, but not what I was doing. I will do something different now. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have said it yourself that other interest, you yes. know, since now, since I wrote my, my, my books, you know, my books, I always say this, have opened doors for me. Uh, you know, I am now an online TV uh, show host. You wow. Know? Yes. And, and I'm also in, in the acting industry now. Okay, so let's just stop there. You're an online TV show host. Yes. How do people access it and what is it that you talk about? And, you know, who are, like I have you here today yes. as my guest, <laughs> yes. what are the type of personalities that you that you interview on your show? Okay. My show is, is based on the people who are doing impact in their communities. So I focus mainly on those ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things, you know. And those people, some of them are not known, you know. So I call them to the show to come and give the viewers information about what they are doing and how can the viewers get actually access to them, to those. How long is the show been running? Uh, it has been running for two years now. But it's online. It's online. How yes. do you subscribe to it? You just go to your YouTube because we stream uh, every Tuesday at, nine, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Right. Yes, so you can just get my... An hour long? No, 30 minutes. 30, 30 minutes. minutes, yes. How did that come about? And you're still holding a full-time job as a butler. Yes. How did that come about? Okay, I, I went for an interview about my books, just like I'm here with you today. <laughs> and when I got there, I actually had that conviction of saying, you know, uh, what this person is doing, interviewing me, I can also do it. But focusing on my interest or my passion. He was interviewing people about, about books, those who have written books. But I said, my focus is on people who are doing impact in their communities. So I can have a show where I invite such people to come and share about their experiences, about their journeys, on my show. And then I made a proposal to the, to the channel and my proposal was actually accepted. And every person has a story to tell, exactly, don't they? Yes. You have been nominated as uh, one of the South African heroes. Yes. Am I right? You are right. Who nominated you and how did you feel about being told that you've been nominated? It was one of those, you know, I remember um, is the, the organization is run by the, a lady by the name of Amanda Machaka. Uh, and she's working for SABC. So she's the one who came with that concept of actually acknowledging people who are doing the difference in their communities. And, and my show also and my services under my company made me to be nominated, you know, uh, because apart from my TV show, I also do services like book writing, coaching and speaking coaching where I, I coach people how to write books. Because remember I told you that I struggled writing a book. So I realized that there are people who are like me, who are also struggling to write their books. 
They don't know where to go, what to do. And I said, I want to fill up that gap. As I struggled, I no longer want to see other people struggling, you know. So I made a commitment of coaching people who want to be writers. So those services and my TV show made me to be nominated as South oh, wow. African Hero Award. When, how do people who are struggling to write uh, a book, how do they get in touch with you? How regularly do you give these classes and where do you have them? Okay. Every year I have a, a seminar, book writing seminar, where I invite everyone aspiring writers and even writers, current writers, to come and learn more about writing. And I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So they can access me through my Facebook. I'm actively on social media, on Karabilo Wisdom Mokoto. So that's where I actually do post a lot of things that I do there. Okay, let's go for an ad break. When we get back, we'll talk about your remaining books and your current job yes. as a butler. Okay. On Karabile Wisdom Makoto is my amazing guest. He's talking about his life, started out as a security guard, and just look where he is today. So really, anything and everything is possible. If you can dream it, you can make it happen. Stay tuned. Welcome back on Karabile. Wisdom Makoto is my guest talking about his amazing life. We're going to get to your three books. At what point did you then decide, I need to move on, I can't remain a security guard for the rest of my life? Where and how did you get to the next step of becoming a butler at a five-star hotel? <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. Um, I worked there uh, as a security for two years in the same hotel. So it happened that one day my story appeared on the Star newspaper. Wow. And the Your star story about your first book like, and the fact that you're a se yes, security yes, guard. Yes, I remember the title uh, of the article was Security Guard Takes to the Bookshelves. Wow. You know, and, and every day the Star newspaper delivers, I mean the Star delivers newspapers in our hotel. So the Star newspaper is always there. So the management saw my story, you know, and they didn't know actually what I'm doing. They just, as you were saying, they just saw a security guard, you know, not really considering what I'm doing. They didn't know anything. They just, you were invisible to them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But after my story, that's where they realized that actually we have an asset in our company. You know, why can't we hire this guy? He can be an asset to our company. And, and I remember I applied and because they knew me, I had no difficulty. Good on you. Yes. So you then moved on to become a waiter and yes. then a butler. What is a butler? A, a butler is actually an executive waiter. You know, um, For an example, where I work, we have two restaurants. We have an ordinary hotel, I mean restaurant, and actually the VIP restaurant. So a butler usually works there. We provide services to VIP guests. You know. We, we serve a, 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 I mean, breakfast and also beverages later afternoon. So that's what the butler does. Okay, um, four years later, you are still there. Yes. Any plans of furthering your career in the hotel group or do you have bigger plans and bigger dreams for yourself? <laughs> uh, to be honest, I, I have a bigger dream for myself. You know, I, I love what I'm doing at the moment saving guests, you know, hospitality industry is a very good industry where you work with people. So I enjoy what I'm doing, but I have bigger dreams for myself, you know. Uh, as I'm in media at the moment, I think I want to grow myself in media. I want to grow myself as a speaker, professional speaker, you know, because I have currently launched a speaking academy, which will commence very soon, you know, this, this February. Uh, it's a six months course where I teach about speaking and media. Yeah. And what, is this going to be an online teaching no, no, course? No. No. no, it's going to be live. group coaching, yes. Mm -hmm. It's going to be live. So that's what I want to grow myself with. And I also want to grow my TV show. You know, I want to take it to the bigger platforms. So that's, that's my When you passion. talk bigger platforms, what are you referring to? I'm referring to like not online only, you know. The mainstream media? Mainstream, yes. Mainstream, okay. yes. Um, so... In between all of this, you're writing books. So you wrote your first book because that was when you were exposed to religion, to Christianity yes. and to the power of God. Yes. 
when and how did the second book come about? Okay. What motivated you to write the book and has it made an impact? Yes. Uh, my second book titled The Power of Planning. I was inspired about successful people and I observed different kinds of people in life and especially about success. And Do you think your position as a butler has given you some form of advantage because you indicated that you work in an upper middle class environment? Does that, has that given you some insight and also motivation to move on? <laughs> yes, it, it, it does, it does. Um, as I'm saying that I'm working in a VIP section, you know, that's where I, I meet a lot of people, business people, you know, people that we know, and, and I can make connections there, you know. I remember I met, one day I met this lady by the name of uh, Lisa Nichols. She's one of the American author, you know, a very successful one, a very famous one. And, and I met her, I was saving her, and I explained to her that actually I know you, because I know, I, I mean, I, I follow them as a young writer. And I told her that I know you, you're a writer, you're a motivational speaker. And I told her about myself and she was so interested and she inspired me, she said, no, you are doing a very good job, you know, continue with what you're doing and one day you will, you will reach where you want to go. So your second book, The Power of Planning, how important is it to plan, number one? And in terms of when you self-publish, you don't have the luxury of an editor going through reading the book critiquing the book, possibly telling you to rewrite a chapter, maybe to edit the book, etc. How do you realize that you're onto a good thing here? Okay, let me start by this one of the importance of planning. You know, planning is very, very important. Uh, I said that planning is like a map. It directs you where you should go. You know, if you don't know where you are going, the road will take you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no way, possibly. <laughs> no way, <laughs> you know. And, and if you don't have a plan in life, someone else will plan for you, you know. You will end up doing someone's plan because you don't have a plan for your life. So it's very important to plan. So basically you're going to be a puppet. Exactly. How has that book been received? And talk to us about your two subsequent books. My book has been received well. It has sold a lot of copies. It has opened doors for me. Wow. I have been featured in many newspapers, you know, TV shows, radio, because of those books. So it has sold, it has very, did very well, you know. And, and my, my two books, again, uh, is last year. I released my two books, Rule Through Your Knowledge, and my latest is Profit From Your Gift. Now, Rule Through Your Knowledge and Profit... From your, your gift, gift yes. from your gift, both yes. are very similar sounding. It's about do what you know, yes. follow your dreams, follow your passions, because if you do what you know, you're going to get excellent results. Exactly. With due respect to you and your current position, how come you are still there? How come you're still a butler? I'm not minimizing <laughs> the role you play, but four books later, have the powers that be in the organization not seen what a gem you are? Have they not been able to open up other opportunities for you? They have. They have opened other opportunities. But, you know, as I've said earlier, that when you are a self-published author, everything depends on you. It's like you are starting a business. It's like you're an entrepreneur, by the way. So as an entrepreneur, Things don't just happen by magic, you know. You have to start somewhere. You start small, grow. So I'm in a process of growing since I'm still there as a partner. Because I don't want to be... You're not in a hurry. You don't you. want to, I to say, Yes, I don't know. Career. I wanted to say that. that <laughs> I don't want to be excited <laughs> yes. and then be in a hurry and leave everything mm -hmm. only to find out that things are not going well in that time. Then I struggle. Or possibly they move you to a position and you're not well matched yes, for that position. Yes. And then you start failing rather than uh, blooming or progressing exactly. or growing. Exactly. Okay. Uh, talk to us about those two books because it seems to be focused on where you want to be yes. eventually. Yes. <laughs> Roll Through Your Knowledge uh, is a book that I wrote after I realized the power of knowledge. You know. If, let me just say this, I usually say this, that in life, there are people who get paid for what they know. 
and there are those who pay for what they don't know. <laughs> so if you don't know, it means you will pay for what you don't know. But if you know, then you are in advantage. You will be paid for what you know. So it's very important that you acquire knowledge. Hence, I say rule through your knowledge. If you have knowledge, you will rule in the area of your interest. And the last book? Profit from your gift. The, that book, I'm in love with that one. That profit from your gift. I've discovered that people are struggling in life because they think that there are no jobs, they are not, they are not educated, only to find that God has given them gifts or talents that they can use to actually make a successful living. For an example, people like Tiger Wood, Serena Williams, you know Serena Williams, those people get paid because they are using their gifts and talents. They are not using their education. I'm not saying education is not important. You know, my viewers must not actually get me wrong. Education is very important. As Nelson Mandela has said, that education is a very powerful tool that can change the world, you know. But we must not ignore our talents and gifts. God has given us those gifts to use them to make a successful living. So follow your dreams and you're passionate enough you can make an awesome life exactly. for yourself. Yes. We've got two minutes to wrap up. How are the book sales going and how do people get um, hold of the books? Okay, uh, the book sales are going well. And if people are interested, they can, as I've said earlier, they can just ac get access to me on, on, on social media, on Facebook. Onkarabilo uh, is Dom Mukoto. I'm actually more active on social media. So they can get hold of me there. The people who are around you when you dropped out of university, someone could have intervened and made sure there were funds available for you to complete your degree. What are they saying to you today that you've written you know, four books later and you're making such a success of your life? You're running this online channel. You're going to open up an um, uh, academy. A academy. And there's just so much more to you. There's just so much more you are doing. Are they apologizing? <laughs> you know, that's a good one because some of them actually criticized me when, when I dropped out. And, and I usually say this, that I remember I used to run away when I was working as a security guard. When I saw them, my former university mates, I used to run away from them. Because you were embarrassed. Because you didn't want them to see you as a security yes. guard. But today, they are the ones who are now running after me. You know, they are complimenting me. Some of them actually want to make an appointment with me just to see me, you know, and I don't have time, <laughs> you know. How do you view security guards these days? Do you look at them with new eyes and with great respect? Very, 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 very respect. I don't want anything to do, you know, I don't want people to do anything to them. I love those guys because I understand that some of them are there because of situations. They are not yes. there because they like it, you know. But as you were saying that, it's not only security guards, cashiers, domestic workers, you know, you name them gardeners and stuff. We've come to the end of the show, but I do hope and pray you are doing something to target that sector of the community, to start motivating them and to make them realize they are real people. Yes. They have dreams, they have wishes, and they can aspire to ful fulfill those dreams. Very true. Please work on that as a project going I'll forward. That. I'll do that. <laughs> Wonderful having you on the show. Thank you indeed. Much success going forward, and hopefully we'll catch up again at some stage. Thank you, thank you so much. There you have it, my first guest, a dynamic young man um, on Carabile Wisdom Okoto, started out live as a security guard, is still working as a head waiter or a butler, but in the process has written four books and has been doing a whole host of amazing things. So again, I said it, I said it on Wednesday, I say it again, dream big and follow your dreams because they can become a reality, inshallah. And welcome back. We're now going to be talking to the character company. Jakob van Skalkveik is in studio with me. And he's going to talk about why the company was formed, the type of work they're doing. And we're also going to touch a little bit on the tragedy two weeks ago in Brits where the young Parktown school learner 
drowned. So it's all about um, mentoring the boy child, the importance of it, not only in South Africa, but I should imagine globally. Jakob Hans Kalkweg, good morning. Welcome to the program. Morning, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Great to have you here and great to hear that there are companies and individuals like yourself going out into into South Africa, trying to make a difference, um, hopefully, you know, touching young lives so that they grow up to be strong young men with a definite purpose in life and they don't end up in criminality and on street corners. So how did this all start for you? So I've been, I've been in the NGO space for the last 22 plus years um, and uh, I think one of the things I've seen there is uh, is very much what I experienced in my own life. So we we, we currently look at statistics that tells us that 67% of our children are growing up in single parent homes. Um, our own experience tells us that four out of five boys do not have a positive male role model in their lives. That means you know dad's either not there at all, or there's just um, dad's there but not present. Too exhausted um, to even interact with yeah. the child at the end of the day. And so that that leaves our, the boy child specifically growing up with without the positive male influence, you know, positive masculinity that he needs in his life. That's just the way that that that, that we that, that we develop um, from a, from a boy child point of view. Um, having grown up with an absent father myself, I think I realized more and more as I grew older the challenges that they brought to me. Sadly, when you, when you start out as a young boy and there's an absent father or there's that gap, you don't immediately recognize that. So I think if I, at seven, seven years old, understood that there's a gap, I need to fill it, I would have gone out there and found positive male role models and filled my life with them and kind of corrected the path, in, in, so to speak. But it's a, it's a cycle that, only, uh, that you only discover later. So by the time you really start understanding that something is, uh, there's gaps, I mean, you, you would be by you know, 15, 16, and then, then you have a lot of other challenges to deal with, and it's, it's a bit late. Um, typically a boy with an absent father or where there's no positive male role models, by 10, 11, you know, that boy is under, start making a decision for himself that this is going to have to be on me. I'm, I'm going to have to figure this out. So it, it comes from that background. And um, the character company was formed uh, seven years ago. And I think it came out of a space of just understanding that we cannot as a society keep on trying to deal with the symptoms of what we are experiencing. We have to find preventative work. And no one or very few people seem to be prepared to put in the energy and investigate what is it that is going to take the preventative measures. It's not popular. It's hard work. It's not, um, it's not glamorous. And uh, we understood that that's what we want to do. And so the character company was started with the aim to raise boys to be good men, to huh. fundamentally build into their lives from a young age. How do you identify the boys that need mentoring and how long does the mentoring run for? And do you ever find, I know you said you're seven years in the making, but do you find you've now taken in a couple of boys, one or two of them are very resistant to the actual program and they're there, they're st sticking it out for whatever reason, mm. but they're resistant, they fight you all the way. So, and all their own issues, yes. obviously. <laughs> um, so, to uh, just to come back, so I essentially, one of the things that we understood is that it has to be a long-term approach. So, our, our focus is on, on boys coming into the program between the ages of five and ten. So, if you look at the development stage of a, of a child, boys and girls, um, it differs differs slightly, but particularly between five and ten, dad's impact in your life is the highest. You know, before five, it's mom's impact, then it's dad's impact, and then it becomes friends and peers, peers. And, and so that dangerous, becomes uh, very zone. dangerous especially i mean even if you had a mom and a dad present in your life i mean if you had one out of five kids that's still a dangerous space yes. for you um so we decided from the beginning that we will focus on that age group. So the younger we can get a boy into the program, the better it would be for that space. And so you know, getting a five-year-old into the program is ideal because we start building a relationship, we, sit, we lay down the value system, you know, we, we are focused on five very specific and very strong values that we teach the boys and impart to them. And that becomes the foundation of the program because as the husband of the house or as the man that grows up, you're responsible for the value system for your family. And so that's important that you lay that down. So we, we start that. So... And then it's a long-term process. So we also understood from the beginning that a lot of times we want to we want to get into a space, we want to do something. I think as a society we've come to a place where you know I want to do something quickly and I want to. You know, it looks great it's the and instant, it's like it's the instant myself. society. <laughs> That's right. You and talk, there's no there's no place for it in right. this challenge. You talk uh, long term, so you take them in ideally from the age of five. Yes. When do you release them, so to speak? We don't. <laughs> Which is what also makes it a very complex. You hold process. their hand to yes. what age? So what we 
doing is they, they run through certain stages in the program. So what we would call our, our five, six, and seven year olds, which we call our bonsais. Um, then there'll be junior acorn seniors, and those are just uh, kind of internal terms based on a logo, which has got an acorn in it. And the development around that is from a seed to grow into a, 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 an oak tree, which is a protective. And, Lovely you know, concept. Yeah. So, so we build around that. So the idea is you come through the process. Uh, you're often in group. You've, you're in a group with five other boys. There's a positive male role model, what we call a, a fat man, a faithful, available, and teachable guy that, that is in there, that, that, that sees that group every week. So it's an intensive project. We do intentional mentoring. It's not just like, oh, let's see what we can do once every six months. So and what's then it they daily from what weekly. time? Weekly? So, yeah. so we'll typically... Once a week. Once a week. So the idea from a mentorship point of view is that the boys see a mentor once a week, either in the afternoon during the week after school or on a Saturday morning. The idea would be is that there's someone in their life. And we've, uh, we've built a, a kind of a curriculum around that. So the mentors are screened, vetted, and trained, and they get guidance around that to to, to to walk the boys through a, through a, I want to say a process. So there's a bit of a there's a bit of a um, uh, idea behind it. It's not just like oh let's see what we can do, but it's also I mean we work with boys and we boys ourselves. So our attention span is not great, and so we it's very activity based. It's very much um, uh, get, getting getting engagement and teaching boys through the process the values um, you know what what makes a good man uh, you know stuff that we don't typically good at like you know conflict resolution you know listening skills you know that kind of stuff. And we want to just put anger that in. is a big thing. Huge you know? uh, conflict management, anger mm -hmm. issues. How do you deal with that? But also um, stuff like vulnerability. Growing up in a society where we are going to be um, part of something, we want to build community, not just career. We want to get out there. We want to drive the fancy car, have the big salary. Uh, that's building career, and we're not thinking about building community. You know, essentially, I need to be a good husband, a good father, a good member of society. That that must come first before all the other stuff. And so we lay lay those foundations, and then you just go through the process and um, through high school, we then do a, a program where we focus a bit more on um, servant leadership. And so how do we get our older boys to come and serve at the younger boys' camps? Wow. Our camps are very age-specific, so you won't have a five-year, except for our year-end camp, which is a celebratory experience. Um, your, your camps are very age-specific. So in the school holiday times, we do uh, you know, four or five day camps, and that's very age specific. Our weekend camps the same. Um, every boy in the program will have access to a mentor once a week. Uh, two weekend camps, two you know, school holiday camps, um, events throughout the month. Uh, and so it's all just uh, places where we get to interact with the boys, get them okay. to build friendships, but then they stay in the program. All so right. to answer that question is, we want to raise them as, as young leaders and fold us back to become mentors. So these boys, essentially, the five-year-olds... So they've, old, got to give, they've got to give back they as must well. Give back, yeah. Where do you source these young children from? How do they get to you? I'm thinking not necessarily only disadvantaged communities because you could be a middle-class, upper-middle-class family and still yes. have an issue of an absent parent and that child needs positive yes. role modeling. For us so the, what if someone like that approaches you and says, this is my situation, yeah. Can you help? Please help. Our, our heart is that every boy in our country should have a positive male role model. It should be his dad first, but if the dad's not present, we should have a mentor in that space. We have to learn that mentorship ultimately is the only way that we are going to fix the, the great challenge of our society. It means that I must be mentored myself, and in, in the moment that I get into a space that I'm ab able to, I must mentor someone else. That's how I pay it forward. Um, and so, for us, it's a question of if there's, if there's no dad, there's no positive male role model, there's a disadvantage that we need to address. And so any boy coming from that space will be welcome in our program. The ideal intake between 5 and 10. One of the questions you asked earlier is the resistance. The only resistance that we found in the program to this day has been boys 13, 14, 15 and older that comes into the program. Um, you mean older boys that haven't been exposed to the been, program prior right, to yeah. that. So what is the resistance? I think it's come to the space where you just find that you are doing this on your own. So now suddenly you're in a place, and, and, and I mean, it's horrible to say, but I think we're just too late then. You know, we, we as a society, we've turned our back on our young people. You know, the 17-year-old the, the, the guy that gets involved in a school stabbing or a gang rape, you know, 12 years ago, that was a 5-year-old with um, no positive male role model in his life. I mean, that, that's where it started out. And so by 17, we are too late. It's okay, let's go for an ad break. Yeah. I want to come back and talk about the issue around anger in teenagers and how you turn that around. And what about those young adults that have fallen through the cracks? There was no such organization like the character company when they were growing up. Is there still hope for them? All of that and more. I'm talking to... Uh, 
Nyako van Skalkweg from the Character Company. We're talking about positive male role models. And we do know Sal C has uh, take a girl child to work. That's once a year. But I have no doubt in my mind there are many other such organizations doing there, but paying it forward and hopefully will be making South Africa a great country to be in. Welcome back. We're talking to Yako from The Character Company. And the reason this interview is happening today is uh, the sad, the tragedy of the young learner from Parktown Boys. Uh, Yako talks about, and of course, what I'm saying is that he drowned two weeks ago. Yako's company takes a lot of young boys and young men very regularly on camps. We're going to ask and also find out what are the safety measures they put in place, but very importantly, also the mentoring of young boys. Uh, resistance um, and sourcing. You know, I have never heard of your company prior to the tragedy of the young learner from Parktown Boys. That's when your company's name came to my attention. And I was very curious to know what exactly are you all about and pleased to have learned that you're non-profit that you're trying to make a huge difference in people's lives. So having said that, resistance and where do you source? You know, do I hear about you and then say, I know 10 little boys that need to be mentored? Mm. Or some mother, you know, watches us on TV this morning and says, my child needs to enroll at uh, the character company. I think that's typically how it happens. Um, we, we've, we've never actually gone out and advertised um, the services to, to moms. Um, because we've got such an overwhelming list. I mean, currently in Gating alone, I think we sit on over 200 boys on a waiting list. So our problem is not getting the boys because, um, again, if we look at the statistics, there are so many of them. Um, it is, and the moms talk, you know, the moms, you know, talk to other moms is like, and because there's so many single moms out there, they, 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 they share this, they share the experiences of the, um, how amazing it is for their, for their sons to be part of something where, where, the, where the, the responsibility that is really not mom's responsibility is, is being taken care of by a partner. So we, we come in in a partnership and saying, how do we assist you as a single mom? How do we help you through these things? We run a very strong mom support program. Um, my awesome life, uh, Lorraine, runs that for us. And so that's also connecting with the moms the whole time. And so we built this and holistic approach. And I need to approach. have her in here to talk about <laughs> yeah. her part and yes. the role she plays yeah. in supporting moms. It's very, it's very important. Thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, in this picture, we lose out of sight the enormous burden um, that we're putting on a single mom Absolutely. to go like so. So I've, as as a as a as a dad or a man in South Africa, I've walked out of that, and yet I'm the first one to point the finger at why you're not doing better, why you know, and and yet there, there's a portion of mom's responsibility that she's now taking on that's not hers. This is not her issue. That that, that was supposed to be me. I, I was supposed to do that. So so moms are out there. They they come and uh, so for us the hardest thing is to find the positive male role models. You know, men that are prepared to make this commitment because it is a commitment. Men that are prepared to to undergo a bit, a bit of a self-search about where is my identity lying and how do I deal with this. So that's our biggest issue. And then, um, like I said earlier, the, the resistance we find comes from the space where, um, you know, at, 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 as early as 12, I figured out this, I have to do this on my own. And now to be into a space where I have to break that down and going, actually, I don't have to do this on my own and now I'm part of something. You know, when we, when we work with our boys, um, they, are, they are put in a space where they have to be confronted with... Um, the, the lack of social interaction that we find in our society. You know, you put 10 boys around a table, you give them cell phones, you can keep them busy for a, a, like a weekend. You put them around a table uh, at a camp or an, an event and they have to interact socially, um, learning, you know, just, uh, you know, body language and social skills. That becomes a difficult thing. I mean, that, that, that's, very, that's very hard for them. So the older boys, when they come into the program late, we do not have the kind of relationship to build that. And that becomes a very, very big problem. They... There are organizations out there that are dealing with that um, in some way or the other, but I think what's lacking in our country is organizations that have, that have taken the, 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 the levels of commitment and sacrifice to take long-term approaches. Um, you know, th there's no way that I can run a six-month course on how to deal with an absent father. Now I've got the certificate and now I'm going to be fine, you know. <laughs> Through even my own life, they, my whole life, there's times that I wanted to check in with my dad, there's milestones, there's challenges, 
So this, the, the whole concept of mentoring needs to be solidified in this. And when I take on the step, if I step into that space and I make this commitment, I need to understand that I, that I make a long-term commitment. Now, we've got boys that we've known for the last seven years that we've built the relationships with. Now, a boy that came into our program at five, seven years ago is a very different 12-year-old than a boy that wants to come into the program at 12. How much longer is he going to be with you the moment he starts tertiary or... Finish at high school. You'll stay with the ideal situation. Will there always be contact with yes. the character company? Because you know the worst thing is so. So a boy goes into high school and he's going from you know I've been in primary school. I've been the big shot. You know I've gone. I've had a mentor in my life. So we're building a culture of mentorship so that that becomes the culture that I'm accustomed to. Now I'm going to high school and suddenly in all the changes in high school and suddenly I'm at the bottom of the food chain and all these things are happening in my life. Now I don't have a mentor anymore. That's a huge challenge for a kid. The same when he leaves high school and go to university or tertiary or start so a job. So how do you fill that gap? We keep on, we, we are you there. You keep on mentoring we stay them. So once a week, do they have telephone contact with you if they need to talk with you? As the, old, as the boys grow older, that yes. becomes part of it. The younger boys, it's just, we're gonna get there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll see you this time. If, if the mom experiences something, the mom can contact contact the mentor on the group or she phones um, Lorraine who's you know a mom supporter and, and it, it channels through there it's a you know we are really involved in the lives of these boys 24-7 yeah. from the way it sounds you know when the wheels come off they don't come off at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning <laughs> they come off you know 10 o'clock on Thursday night so. all right so how do people get in touch with you what are the costs involved you did say you're an NGO and for people who can't afford to pay for the costs of their child being mentored so we are um, on social media, so it's thecharactercompany.co.za is our website, and we are very active on Facebook. It's probably the best place to go and look for us because you can also see the activities we run there. Um, we are, our head office is in, in, in Mindelore in Krukersdorp. Our programs now run across the country. We've got various um, mentorship groups running Eastern Cape, Western Cape, Pumlanga, rolling out uh, more and more. Um, and so it, it's easy to find us there. I can also, um, you know, our, our WhatsApp number, which is 84 People can WhatsApp us there. Um, our website's very extensive with regards to the information around that. We're a nonprofit, so, uh, you know, we do all our own fundraising. And uh, so the, the ways to get involved, if, if, so for a mom in our program, the, the cost is 250 rand a month, which is a value oh, exchange it's negligible. Program. Yeah. Um, but there are, I mean, we've got, again, we spoke about, you know, uh, the, 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 we have boys from all walks of life um, in our program. And if a mom can't afford that, we work with children's homes. Um, you know, we, we've never said to a boy, you can't be part of the program because there, there's an affordability issue. So, you, um, all right. You talked about um, issues around camping, which plays a huge role in making the boy a man, so to speak. Um, and, and then with it all, you know, when you talk mentoring, two other issues that I want to touch on, and, you know, because of time constraints, I'd like us to rush through it, is the issue around anger, anger management, mm -hmm. and bullying. So uh, the importance of camping, what is, what, how does that build character? Is it all about teamwork and knowing and understanding that you're a part of a collective and you need to work, you, you need to have that mindset? Yeah. So I think what's, what's in the news at the moment, obviously, is the whole thing about, you know, is this necessary? And, and I think one of the important things is we understand that, again, if we, if we do shotgun approaches on stuff and we do standalone things, um, if you have a brick as a standalone, it becomes rubble. If you build it into a wall, it becomes a structure. And I think for us, it's very important. So we do nothing as a standalone and like we do this. And then that's why we don't do a program where we'll see you in, you know, in February and then we'll maybe November have another camp. You know, camping is part of our process. It is not the, the, the only part of it. Um, but getting a bunch of boys out into the wild, you know, climbing trees and sitting on a fire, there's an amazing thing that happens there. Our program, you know, in our program, there's no technology. So in your afternoon group, in your camp, you don't bring your cell phone with, there's no games. Um, the games you play there is going to be outside. You're going to build something. And it's phenomenal to see our boys just being out there, you know, to explore the, the nature, to just be out there and experience Oh, you know, we're adventurous by heart. We're adventurous and explorers. And how you survive. And yes. it's all about team building. Yeah. And so that's the whole process in there. I mean, our camps, there's a little bit of learning. So like this past weekend, we had our junior one camp, um, which is our eight to 10 year olds, um, 13 kid, uh, young boys out there. And part of the theme was being honest with myself. You know, what, what am I, what are the stuff that I need to look at for myself? And so we'll do a little bit of talking around that. But the best part of this is that it's a place to build a relationship, to have conversations, to make new friends, um, you know, table manners around the table, you know, uh, social those, interaction, yes. everything in that. Uh, safety issues, and I'm sure you, <laughs> you and the character company, probably in other companies like yourself, mm -hmm. probably are a bit nervous right now after the tragedy yeah. of the Parktown boys drowning. 
What sort of safety measures do you have in place? Because that's crucial, is yeah. it not? Oh, for sure. And I think again, I, look, I, accidents do happen. Yeah, they I think can that's happen very anywhere. Important. Yeah, I think you have to understand that you can have everything in place, and you can still experience a tragedy, and, and that, that we have to accept. But when we are out there and we're fighting for the hearts of these boys, we have an we have a responsibility to do our best, and we have to do better all the time. So what we do at the character company is. We are extremely, um, and, and luckily for us, this is stuff that's been in place. It's part of our standard operating procedures. Um, you know, when we camp with regards to, before we even leave, there's registers. The boys sign their own registers. There's, uh, you know, we, we get up camp. There's a, you know, everyone lines up. There's number. You, we know exactly. There's so many boys. We do what we call roll call on a very frequent basis. I mean, December we camped with 137 boys. Sure. Um, and our year in camp. So it's very, very important. They have you have to have proper protocols in place, and you have to. We can't become um, completely, um, uh, what's the word, lame by by saying, like, I'm not going to get involved in this because of the liability stuff, okay. because that's a I danger. Okay, unfortunately have to yes. rush you. We've got two minutes to wrap <laughs> okay. up time. Two very big issues, yes. bullying and anger. Yeah. Young boys, young men have got lots of anger issues. It's all those hormones and androgens and that going crazy in their bodies. How do you manage that? What are the type of very important messages uh, you give to them to start thinking and start changing their yeah. behavior. So for us, it starts with, with laying down a value system. So if you, when, when you are interacting with someone, you have to do it through your value system. Honestly, honesty, courage, kindness, respect, self-discipline. So if we have a disagreement, and I put that in front of us, and on our website, there's, a, there's actually a clip that we've made about that, and we don't have time to discuss it now, but by those five values, I can actually deflate situations. I have to deal with my anger. A lot of it also happens because suddenly, I'm not cooped up in a space where I don't have a way to get rid of it. There's and someone you, in my life the whole time. if you subscribe to those five values, you're not gonna have the bullying, are you? That's right, because I have to confront those things. The bullying is a serious issue, and it comes also in the space for um, low self-esteem, lack of identity, um, and so I'd rather I'd rather make you look or make you feel less because I think it makes me feel better. Um, we take it extremely serious in our program, and so we you know we constantly interact with the boys, we constantly engage with them. You see, and that's why the relationship is so important. You know, the relationship with the boys means that we have the conversations to understand that. The Tab was having a bully issue at school, which we can then address. We can actually we write an incident report. Um, Lorraine contacts the mum. We try and find the information. Then we'll go to the school. We'll head to the school. We are, we're experiencing this, or we've heard about this, and we are we're expecting you to make to do something about this. So that's something that we never we just like. Oh, I hear what you're saying. You know, try and deal with this. We want to stay in there because that's dad's job. You know, you have to be there to protect your boys. And so for us, we take it extremely seriously and we help our boys to understand, even at camp or activities, because, you know, your boys get, you know, they like, don't stand in my space. And, you know, they, and so in that space, it's like getting them together, talk about the values. Everything you do, just get filtered through the value system. How do you deal with this? Talk through so it. That's, your, that's your reference point, Always, the value yeah. systems. A society without values Absolutely. is what we experience in the moment, and we have to get involved in this. Are this. you hoping to release this by some form of mass media to as many people as possible? Because you're only able to accommodate X amount of children, yes. and it is a long-term program. So if you share all of this with families, with communities, they can get their own little system and Definitely. their own little groups running. Our, what we call our social franchise program or program partners is, is aimed on that. It's community coming to us and saying, oh, listen, I'm dealing it. with this. Wow. I, I can't do mentorship. I and mean, we, we're going to Botswana next week. Um, you know, we start programs there. Communities need, need to need to understand that there's someone here that, that you know, we, we're not the experts, but we've done, we've, we've got seven years of understanding what not to do perhaps. And so what we can do better and we've put structures in place. We can come alongside and guide with your organization. What kind of policies do you have in place? You know, how do we help you with that? So we've, we've learned those lessons. But we have to get to a place where we can get involved. We need to stop being a society that sits behind keyboards, judging everyone without actually stepping out and, and seeing how, how do we do this? How do, I, how do I support a boy for a month on a program? How do I get a boy in a camp? You know, that's and simple stuff. Unfortunately, that's where we have to leave it. Amazing stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Why were you not around when my boys were growing up? <laughs> I wish but, I was around when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Please continue touching lives in a positive way. Thank you very much. And that was Jakob van Skalkwijk talking about the Good Character Company, mentoring boy children, obviously. And if you've got little boys and if you think that the role models in their lives are not strong enough, then these are the people you need to turn to. We're going for an ad break. When we get back, we'll be doing some more talking with our next guest.
Welcome back. Our final interview for the morning is with Sister Khadija Madela. She hails from Fosloris on the East Strand, and she's here to talk about black Muslims in the townships, the challenges being faced by them, and how you and I, inshallah, can make a difference. Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Salaam Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. Lovely to have you here. And obviously you told me off air that uh, you embraced the beautiful Dean of Islam about 12 years ago. Sure. What brought you to that point? What was it about Islam that you knew or heard about at that point in time? Or who was it that introduced you to Islam? For me, I, uh, I, I used to work in Fort Speck. So I used in to, Fordsburg? Yes, in Fordsburg. <laughs> okay. I used to see a lot of Muslims. So there was an old man that I used to, when I come to work, he used to ask me, you don't like to be a Muslim or something like that. I used to I tell this old man that uh, Mkulu, I used to call him Mkulu, but he was Indian. I said, Mkulu, I'm not Indian, I'm black. So this yeah, it's a religion for Indians. So he was telling me that this is not a religion for it's, a, it's Allah's religion, so I think he's the one who motivated me to come to Islam because he used to tell me about Islam, what is it about, it's a religion, it's not a culture for people. So from that time of being surrounded by Muslims, I used to see goodness from their Mashallah. side. Mashallah. So that, that light, it brought me to Islam, that made me love Islam. Unfortunately, the perception amongst lots of non-Muslims is that Islam is an Indian religion. Only Indian people follow Islam. And that, as, as, as a Muslim yourself, have now realized that that is totally untrue. Yes. You have all colors and nationalities all around the world who are Muslim and not necessarily um, revert Muslims. They born Muslims and they third, fourth, and even uh, you know longer generations of Muslims. Mm -hmm. How has that changed your mind about being Muslim yourself? It, it changed my mind a lot because for me, when I wanted to convert to Islam, I went back to my location. I was looking for the, the, the masjid for the location because I thought where I was staying, there was no Muslims. And I used to tell people uh, from Fosbeck, I said, there's no Muslim around locations. They have never seen one. Uh, and it was a wrong information because when I went back to my community, I found a masjid in my community. Oh, wow. And as now, embrace, I embraced in Fosloras, and uh, uh, everything I did in Fosloras, not in Fosbeck. Uh, Fosbeck, they, they introduced me to Islam, but everything I did in my community. So there is black Muslims around us, and for me, what uh, uh, the most important thing that I, I want people to, 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 to come to Islam and understand that it's for all of us, it's not for... Uh, Alhamdulillah, yeah. Alhamdulillah for that. How has being, having reverted to Islam, how has it changed you as a person? It, ta it taught me a, a, a lot, especially uh, about cleanliness, about, uh, 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 about being a mom. You know, Islam is bringing, uh, as a woman, you know, I've learned a lot as a woman, how to, 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 to be disciplined as a woman, how to act, how to raise a family as a Muslim woman and things like that, and as well to learn more about Islam. So I've learned a lot of things, you know, to, to say it in one way, to the things that I've learned, it, 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 it's a lot. Awesome, Alhamdulillah. Mm. So who taught you, who took you through the steps? So for a long time, this man in Fordsburg kept telling you about embracing Islam. Mm. When was that moment? When did you arrive at the crossroads and decide, I'm now going to take the Shahada and I am going to become Muslim and learn, le live as a Muslim? I. I there was a, there's a shopping center in Spreadview where I used to just pass when I'm, yeah, I'm doing things, when I'm going to do shopping, I used to see this uh, Muslim guy because most of the time in the location you see men, 
dress as Muslims, we don't see women. So I thought there was no women, it's only men. So I approached this, he was a Molana at that time, it was Molana Harun. I approached him, I said, say, please explain to me why you dress like this. What is it about that you are representing and what is it all about? So he told me about Islam. He, he told me at that time that Islam, it's a religion that is for Allah. He explained everything to me. So from that time, I went to him. I said, I want to know more. Please, I want to know more. Because this, I can see the love that I've been experiencing in Fosbeck. So I want to experience that same love. And I can, I, I can just put it that it's, it's, it's Allah's love. Because people who don't know me, they've come to me and told me about Allah. And I've been a Christian. I've never heard about Allah. So I want to know what is it about. So he explained to me. At that time, he, he just explained everything about Islam. At that time, my heart was, was agreeing to what he was telling me. I said, yeah, Allah, this is my time for me to convert. Because he said, if you're going to say your family uh, are not Muslim, but Allah choose whomever, he is pleased with that person. Maybe it's you who's going to be the Muslim, the first Muslim in your family. How did your family then respond? How did you go home and tell them that you've decided to take the Shahada and that your life is going to change the way you dress, the way you live, the way you cook, the way you eat, the way you interact with people? How did you explain all of this to them and what was their response? It was a challenge the huge challenge. Because, and I, 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 going to convert as a Muslim, I didn't think the challenge it was after me embracing Islam because I have to go back to my mother and my father whom they were not Muslims, they're still not right now, but I had to um, make them understand that this is the path that I'm choosing as a Muslim and I'm going to change how I dress, how I eat. It was a challenge. It was a challenge coming from a a black community, community and a black uh, society. It was uh, a huge challenge because when I'm dressed in long clothes and putting my scarf on my head, they're asking me questions. Are you married? Or is your husband passed away? Ooh. Because that's what they associate. When we're wearing black, they think it's about uh, somebody passed away. So why are you wearing black? Why? You're praying now five times a day. Now there's a month of fasting. Why are you not eating? Things like that. So it was a challenge, but I've overcome it because my family right now, they do understand and they love the path that I've chose. Have you managed to get anyone in your family to embrace Islam? My brother even went to university to study uh, Arabic, but I told him that that is not Islam. That is not Islam, it's just the language that you've learned. But he, 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 he loves Islam, even though he hasn't embraced, but everything that is happening, if it's a month of Ramadan, he will try and fast with me. Like, they, they, they love it. Inshallah, he will too soon take the Shahada. Amen. Whom did you go to for, for example, Madrasa lessons? Whom did you go to to learn? how to dress, how to make wudu, how to take ghusl, and then more, and then as important, obviously, how to read your salah, etc., etc. Uh, there was a sister, uh, Sumeya. Molana, he, he just explained to me that at that moment, his wife was not around. So he, he told me there's a sister in Fosloras that just, she's from my, she's in Madras and Azadville, so I can go to her oh, wow. and then contacted them. So that family welcomed me. The mother, she was Muslim also, her girls, seven of them, they were Muslims. <laughs> so they took me into that family. They started to teaching me everything about Islam. Let's go for an ad break. We'll be back in a minute or two. Khadija Madela from Fosloris on the East Rand is here to talk about her journey into Islam. Alhamdulillah, we'll talk more to her after the ad break.
She embraced Islam 12 years ago, but it hasn't come without its challenges. Her name is Khadija Madela. She comes from Fosluris. We're going to talk about some of those challenges and highlights um, on her journey to Islam, inshallah. Um, when you, so how long did you stay with this family before you got the initial understanding of Islam and uh, confident enough to take your Shahada? It was something I did for the first month. I used to go to them every day. And like I used to go to them from morning until the afternoon. So they will take me from how to make Husel, how to make Wudu, everything that is the, the prayers, how I prepare myself for the daily prayers, everything that is, is, is to do with the daily preparation. Day-to-day -day yes. life of a Muslim. Yes, that's what they helped me with. So it went on. This family became my family. We were like... Every day we, we have to talk. If it's not on the phone, it's to go into I'm still in contact with them. I'm still in contact with them. They are my family. So what is your aim? Are you, are you now in the community as a Muslim, 12 years on now? And are you wanting to spread Islam further into the townships? And if you say yes, the question is why? Uh, yes, I want to spread Islam in the community. Reason being, as I've been challenged uh, a lot in the location, Islam is very challenging because people, uh, they're not used to Muslim, especially the women. Women, is, they always uh, in hiding. We, we, we remain at home and even our neighbors, they don't know what is going on. When we're coming out, we go maybe to the malls. It's even difficult to come to a person and approach them and say, why are you dressed like this? What is happening? So for me, I was thinking we make a hijab day. Oh, wow. For us to understand that our community around us, they understand why we dress like this. Why is it important for a Muslim woman to be covered all the time? So, because what I've, 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 I've experienced, they don't understand why. They just see people who are dressed like this. And some of them, when they're watching the news, they hear a lot of things, negative stuff. So it's difficult for a person that is close to me to understand what is my religion and what does it stand for. So when and where are you going to plan the hijab day? How are you going to invite non-Muslim women in the area to come in here and understand what the hijab is all about? And that's the first step. Um, Alhamdulillah, and from there you can go on to so many other opportunities where you can teach people about Islam. And let's hope and pray by so doing, you bring more and more people into the fold of Islam. But even if you don't achieve that, just explaining the beauty of Islam to non-Muslims, inshallah, they will respect who we are, why we dress and why we eat the way we do. For me, I always give dawah wherever I go. Even, even today, coming to this studio, I brought a non-Muslim person to see what Muslims are about. I think if you invite somebody next to you, they spread the word to other people who don't fear Islam. I've seen a, a Muslim person, I'm staying with them. I know why they dress like this. I know the, 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 how, why they pray five times a day. Most of the thing, the basic stuff that we need to teach our community. So for me, I was thinking to make the hijab day. I bring people that are closer to us. Like you bring somebody, I asked a, a sister in the mosque, I said, please bring the person next to you who's not a Muslim. So it will be easier for them to understand you and to understand Islam. And for them, for, by them doing that, they also bring other people. They say, okay, Islam, they invited us to their mosque. So they will, it will be easier for them to tell other people about Islam and say, no, they are not Indians. No, they don't just speak English only. They have Zulu speaking people, Sutu speaking people. So it's easier if you just bring it to people and make it friendly to, to people. They know that it's not something they must shy away, but it's something that should, they should bring themselves closer to. How big is the Muslim community in the township where you're living in? It, it, it is growing by a day. We, we're having Muslims that embrace every tumor. 
I see Mashallah. new ladies that come there. But it's to keep people in Islam that is a challenge because they embrace, but some of them, they go back and live. Why life. do you think that happens? I think... Uh, for me, I was lucky because I had people who, who loved me and even brought me closer to Islam and made me their sister there, everything. For them, I think when they come in, there's no one who's saying, let me, let me walk this journey with no you. No support. There's no support. So how can we as the Muslim community make a difference and to help you support um, the women and this growing community of black Muslims in Fos Luris? And I am aware of the fact, let me hasten to add, that in most of the townships all around South Africa, there are lots and lots of volunteer um, born Muslims that are volunteering and they're doing as much da'wah as they possibly can. So there is help available and inshallah after the program we will give you contact numbers and names to get in touch with people because what you also indicated is that literature, Qurans, Kitabs etc are sorely needed in the area that you live in. And I should also imagine that clothing, abayas, uh, scarves etc will be most welcome to pass on to your Muslim sisters. I was thinking even if we can have a shop of, of, of hijabs in our area because there's nothing like that. So they don't even know where we buy our things. They ask ourselves, where did they get this? clothes? Where do they get their scarf? So if they see a shop, a normal shop that you can walk in and, and because some they even like the dresses, but they don't know where to get them. So I think if we can bring something that is going to, you know, to be same as Fortsburg, when you go there, you find a shop, you find a restaurant, people they understand that what you, they must eat, you can still go to the restaurant and eat, you can still go to the shop and buy clothes. You understand? So I make a suggestion here now, you've been exposed to the Fordsburg trading area, perhaps you should approach one of those shops to let you then carry a range of their clothing and the Muslim sisters that you come into contact with and prospective new Muslimas, you can tell them that they can buy the clothes from you. Um, that's one of the issues. And you also need literature. So people need to get literature they to you. They need to get books. It, 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 it's, it's better to spread a word with a book. If someone yes. is asking about Islam, it's better to give them a book to read. Absolutely. And something that is, they can understand. There was books that we used to get. It was even in our languages. So I think that will be helpful to the Muslim sisters or anyone who's coming to embrace Islam to understand Islam better because it's, it's in your language and it's in your area. Absolutely. How many women are you mentoring at this point in time? Uh, in Fos Luras, it's, you know, they are 50 plus women. How often do you get in touch with them to talk, you know, to have maybe like a talim session to talk about Quran, Hadith, etc.? Et uh, talim, we, 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 we just started now and it's, it's on Tuesdays. We, it's, it's every Tuesday or every Tuesday of the week. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that is, is growing on us now, right now. It's not something that it's been there before. So we, we're just starting this thing because ladies, they used to go to places like uh, Palm Ridge for, for Talims and going to Carltonville for Talims. So we're trying to bring it to Fos Loras. Absolutely. We can do this in our areas. What else do you need? Because I'm thinking by way of this program and even the community that I live in, maybe we can put some resources together and assist. So you're looking for, for Qurans books. in what language? If it's, it's Zulu, we have Zulu, Sutu and uh, I think English. It's Zulu, preferred. Sutu in English, English Qurans in English. and any other literature uh, about Islam will be most welcome. It will be most definitely helpful for us. All right. What other challenges are you having? Uh, like I said, if uh, people embrace Islam and live in Islam, that is the challenge that is also breaking my heart because when you convert, you can't just leave something so beautiful. Why do you think Why? they leave? Is it lack of support again? It's a lack of support. That's why now I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself there and say, let me be your sister. Let me be your Muslim sister. Or, let's walk this journey together. If we pray together, that means we are blood, me and you. Let's walk together. And it's helpful when there's, there's, there's books, 
and inshallah and we, we can do things together like if we we have programs and then we we are there together uh the person running the mosque in Fosloris how supportive are is that group of people or that person in terms of all of your needs in the area uh, Molana Taut. Yes. Yes, he's 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 very supportive to us. I, I I I'm not even for 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 us. I think he's a he's he's somebody who's bringing the Islam direct to you because he's there full time. He's not like he's going in and out. He's just there full time. If we need something, if we if he's always there, even for the kids as well because the kids also need. All of this, what I'm asking right now. Inshallah. So what do you want, what message do you want to leave our viewers with this morning about um, the, the, the challenges that revered Muslims face in townships? Uh, for, them, for my Muslim sisters, and I know even for, for the brothers, but I'm speaking to, directly to my sisters, please just love and, and, and come to Islam. Don't shy away from Islam, even the challenges are there. I think everyone went to the same challenges, even our prophet, peace be upon him, he went through the same challenges, but he never left, he never left Islam. So let's not leave Islam, let's just stay in Islam. And let's love the area that we are in and bring the goodness where we are. Inshallah, Amin. Jazakallah for being with us on the show this morning. And I do hope, how do people get hold of you if they want to try and assist in any way they can? They can get, they can get me on my number is 073-054-8178. Okay, if, we, if they haven't managed to get the number down, they can contact us here and we'll pass the number on. Gee. Remember us in your du'as and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you strong and continuously keep you on the path of Islam, inshallah. Inshallah, amin. And there you have it, Sister Khadija Madela talking about the da'wah she's doing in Fosloris on the East Rand. And if there's any way you would like to help this dear sister upkeep the deen in that area, please give her a call. And um, she is looking for English. Uh, Zulu and Sutu Qur'ans and any other Islamic literature, easy to read, easy to understand, perhaps something in the line of Islam for beginners um, and also kitabs and kitabs on ahadith, it will be most welcome. And for those sisters who'd like to perhaps send uh, a whole host of um, scarves and abayas, which she can then pass on to the new Revert sisters, that too will be most welcome. So just get hold of us here at ITV Networks and we'll put you in contact with Sister Khadija. And on that note, uh, Jazakallah for watching. Thank you indeed for your company. As always, take care on the roads. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you every step of the way. Till the next time, as always, it is Khudafiz from me, Julie Ali.